Good. Uh, I want you to do this. I want you to write down this. Just get a little slip of paper. Write this down. Nate and Rachel. I want you to pray for them every day. What they're going into is going to be um, a good work, but it's not going to be an easy work. Uh, we've been looking at that church for over a year and uh, talking to them. Uh, we've been in and out of meetings. Your staff has been supplying over there on Sundays for at least uh, since September, as well as I can remember. And, um, you know, we just struggled and struggled and struggled. God, what do you want us to do? What, what do we need to do? And I, I, I sat down with uh, Jeff and I said, Jeff, we need to do this, 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 and this is what I think we need to do. And I began to, and I just was, I don't know where to start with that. And the Lord just finally said, won't you just get a preacher and let him do what I lead him to do? So I felt like at point in time that that's what we needed to do. Let's just get God's man and let him do what God leads him to do out there. So I want you to pray for him. Some of you may feel called to go out there, uh, just like some did at um, um, Old Town. And uh, some went and stayed, and some went and worked and came back. You do what you feel like God's leading you to do on that. Uh, but this is another great opportunity that this church has to help a church, literally, that was dying. And we can step in and uh, pray to the good Lord that um, he's going to turn that around. Now, when you came in, oh, the other thing was, I was shocked. Caleb's not in here. Did y'all hear Caleb sing? That's the Valley Dale Bob Dylan, right there. There you go. Um, anyway, uh, did y'all pick up a, a sheet that I had printed out for you? Okay. Well, that's the first thing you did wrong. No. Um, there, there are sheets out there. If you want to get one, pick one up. Uh, the very top of the page is going to say unconditional election. How many of y'all have ever heard of unconditional election? I've got one, two, three, four, five. Okay, this number. How many of you have heard of individual election? Uh, what about corporate election? Uh, what about um, by Richard Land? What did Richard Land write on um, not conditional? It is. Anyway, have you ever heard of any other kind of election? There's a third. There's a fourth one out there, and I could just. Gonna now, y'all think y'all laughing at Kirkwood and me? You think it's easy to stand up here and go through some of the? I'm telling you, you're and especially when you get old like Kirkwood, your mind goes. <laughs> it just goes. Well, anyway, you can pick this up. You can also find it on our website. It is a study. This is not going to be incorporated into our, you know, our beliefs uh, that's on there. It's going to be on there for maybe this week. For you to look at it, it's just a guide. It will help you. Uh, Dr. David Allen put this together. He assembled it from various sources, and it just gives you something that will help you uh, if you're interested in this, and if you're not interested in it, all, all is good anyway. Now, if you've got your Bibles, and they're open now to Ephesians uh, chapter 1, I'm going to begin in verse 3, and I want you just to listen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to, to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of his glory, of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intentions, which he purposed in him with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we were in that who were the first in hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory in him you also after listening to the message of truth the gospel of your salvation having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory period Amen. Amen. that's one sentence 
in the Greek, 200 words. Now, we've divided it up into five sentences because we just can't, we just can't do that. And you begin to ask the question, why in the world did Paul write such a long... Listen, it is complicated. You've got all of these clauses and subclauses and all of these verbs that are popping up here, there, and yonder. You begin to wonder, where's the main verb, which is the central verb? You've got all of this stuff going on, and you ask yourself, why in the world did the Holy Spirit lead Paul to write this under inspiration? Let me tell you, when Paul started, verse 1 and verse 2, he just erupted into praise. This is just praise, and he just erupts into it. He just comes out of the chute, and it just bubbles up and it just flows forth out of him. And he's praising the Lord. And look, if you'll go back and look at this, I'm going to show, this is a whole chorus right here. There are three refrains. You can break it down into these three sections, which is what I'm going to do. Uh, this morning, I'm going to make it through verse six from three to six. Look at verse six. It ends this way, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That all, those verses there, three through six, deal with God and, and God's choice of salvation. Then you come, beginning, pick it up in verse seven, and you go down through verse 12. Look at the end of verse 12. Would be to the praise of his glory. That's how he's going to end every one of these sections. There in seven through 12, he's going to talk about how Jesus Christ, God the Son, redeemed us through his blood. And then you come to 13 and 14, and he's going to turn to the Holy Spirit. Look at the end of verse 14, to the praise of his glory. And he's going to end those two verses that way, but he speaks of the Holy Spirit being, listen, literally, how he has sealed us and how he is basically the pledge of our inheritance, our salvation. So he, he literally is going to move through the Trinity and the work of the Trinity in our salvation. When you get to verse 15, all the way down through chapter 2, verse 10, somewhere in there, you, you're going to get Paul just falls into prayer at that point. He's been praising God. Now he just goes into prayer mode, and he's going to pray, beginning in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. He says, I'm going to pray that God would open your mind, open your eyes, open your heart, open your spirit to everything he has just said about salvation. Now, we come to a difficult passage. Um, I've got to deal with election and predestination in the next 40, 50, 60, 90 minutes. Um, and it's not easy to do. And uh, some of y'all think I'm serious. No, I'm, I, I can't. I can't go that long. Um, this is difficult and it is not easy, but I want you to see something, something that I'd never really noticed before. Look at verse 3 where he begins, blessed. Eulagia is the word in the Greek. Eulagia. It's our word. Eulogy comes from it. We think eulogy is a, something you do at a funeral. It's a far bigger word than that. It, it has far greater meaning than that. It means to praise. It can be a praise. It can be a blessing. It can be... Um, speaking well of someone, ascribing to someone what is theirs. It, it's ascribing to God. Do you notice what he does here? He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Often in our prayers, we will pray, Lord, we come and we bless you. What do you do when you bless God? Not one thing. Not one thing. You, you, you can't do anything. You can't add anything to God we're just simply ascribing to God what he already is. But now when God blesses us, what does he do? Finish the rest of the verse. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places uh, in Christ? It comes down from Christ, the blessings, and we are blessed in every spiritual blessing. It's unlimited it's innumerable, the blessings that are on our lives this morning. I heard a guy, I was, I was sitting in the restaurant the other morning, 
And uh, I heard a guy, he made the comment, somebody must have asked him, he said, how you doing? He says, well, he said, I'm doing all right. As long as I got up this morning, I'm doing all right. Well, listen, let me tell you something. It's when I get up, the trouble starts. That's when I really need the blessing. I don't need the blessing when I'm sleeping. It's when I get up and all spiritual blessings, all good blessings come down from the Father above, we're told, in James. So he is blessing us when we bless him. We don't add one thing to him. Now, this is the passage that we're going to work through for the next couple of, couple of weeks. Now, next Sunday, I'll get to verse 7 we'll begin to talk about the redemption that comes in Jesus Christ. But I don't want you to get over the fact that what Paul is doing here is that Paul is just erupting into praise. And he's erupting into praise about our salvation. Though we don't grasp it all, though we don't understand it all, Paul is here and he says, this is what we give praise to God about. This is not an issue to get mad about because none of us know enough about it to get mad about it. But it is something, listen, it's not a ground for us to get angry or short or curt or belittle or, you know, cast off on somebody. It is the grounds of shouting and praising God because it is something that deals with the greatest thing that has ever happened to us and that is our salvation in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to begin there in verse 4, really, because we've really looked last week in just a, a moment here this morning in verse 3. And what I want you to see, what, what I'm going to see, all of salvation is the work of God that should produce joy in the life of the believer. All of our salvation is God's work, and it should produce a joy in us that, like Paul, we just have to shout once in a while. We don't have shouting Baptists anymore. We don't even have Baptists that can say amen anymore, but that's what he's doing right here. Now, let me show you. Salvation was God's plan from eternity past. It wasn't something that God had to come up with once Adam and Eve failed and uh, were disobedient in the garden. It was something that God had planned way back in eternity past. He didn't have to come up with plan B. He knew everything that was going to take place. We'll talk about that in just a few moments, but listen to what he says. He comes and he says this, just as he, that is God, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Now, I assume that you have heard the story, the joke about the drunk who was coming home late one night and uh, decided to take a shortcut, went through the cemetery, uh, and unbeknownst to him, they had dug a grave for the next day, and he fell in it. And while he was there at the bottom of the grave trying to figure out what had happened and how he's going to get out and what was going on, he heard a voice. And what he heard was somebody saying, you take this one, I'll take that one. And he heard it again, I'll take this one, you take that one. You take this one, I'll take that one. You take this one, I'll take that one. It was two robbers who had broken in somewhere and had stolen some stuff and they were divvying it up and the old drunk thought it was the Lord and the devil dividing up the dead. <laughs> now, a lot of people believe that's what election is. Is it somewhere in eternity past, God said, I'll save this one, I won't save that one. I'll save this one, I won't save that one. Well, I can't find that anywhere in the Word of God. I really can't find that in Scripture, but a lot of people believe that's what election is referring to, is that I'm going to save this one, but I'm not going to save that one. And uh, they believe that because it does two things. They say in God deciding beforehand to save some and to not save others is a way to bring glory to himself. Number one, and number two, it is the way to show that he is a sovereign God. 
Now, by God choosing, and for some reason it has never entered my mind that God not choosing some, and by not choosing they would go to hell, that it ever enhanced the glory of God or the sovereignty of God. If you want to see the sovereignty of God, look at how God saved those who put their trust in him. If you want to see the sovereignty and the glory of God, look at how God, through Jesus Christ at the cross and the empty tomb, not only defeated the devil, but defeated the sin of man and defeated the grave and defeated hell. There you see the sovereignty of God. That's the sovereignty of God to me. That's the glory of God to me. Now, that's where some people understand, however, that election, what it means, that's what, it, that's what happened, that's what took place. Um, I, I'm not going to argue that. That's not what I'm going to argue. I'm not going to argue at all. Uh, in fact, I have been questioned, do Baptists believe in election? Well, what are you going to do with this? just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. What are you going to do with this over here in 1 Peter? And I'm not going to go through all of these passages, but over here in 1 Peter, do you remember the first Sunday that I preached, uh, the first sermon out of 1 Peter, where I read Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. What are you going to do with that? All Baptists believe in election, but not all Baptists believe it the same. Now, what is that? That's as Baptist as you can get right there. <laughs> That's just as Baptist as you can get right there. Baptists want to define what they understand election to be. Now, that's what I'm doing. Now, you may have a different view of it. That's okay. You have the opportunity and the right to be wrong. Um, I'm just going to define it the way I understand it. I can't do anything else with it but share with you the way I understand election. Now, the question comes, does election save us? Charles Ryrie, good friend of mine, I preached his funeral. I, I was his pastor for seven years. Charles Ryrie, who was a Calvinist, used to say this, election does not save anyone. That's not how you're saved. Dr. Ryrie said people are saved through faith in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And he's exactly right. Election does not save you. It is faith in Jesus Christ in what he did at the cross in the empty tomb that saved you. So um, we're going to agree that we're not going to debate or be ugly or get mad about this, but that we are going to study. And you have to answer for yourself. You have to work out your own salvation. So here goes mine. Does God know everything? Yes. Do you know how many evangelicals today say God does not know everything? About 40%. About 40%. Blows your mind, doesn't it? Read that statistic this week. About 40%. God knows everything. God is omniscient, uh, all-knowing. He is also omnisapient. That's all wise. He never makes a decision that is not wise. And so God always has known you. Before you were born, God knew you. Somewhere in eternity past, God knew everything there was to know about you. Now, if you look at this and think of this, think of this uh, podium here as human time from the beginning of the world to the end of the world. God lives way out here. He is not subject to time. He is not subject to space. He can enter time in space, but he is not subject to it. He lives out here. He sees all of history taking place right now. He sees right now in 1607, the founding of Jadenstown, and he sees what's happening at Valleydale in 2030, should he tarry that long. C.S. Lewis said, God lives in the eternal now. God has no past. 
Everything for God is in the immediate moment. Does that blow your mind or what? Are you thinking about this? Or are y'all just looking at me? Are you thinking about it? Here's God. In essence, God has known every single thing about you from eternity past. Before your grandparents and great-grandparents were here, he saw when you were conceived. He saw the moment of your birth. He saw when you turned three years of age. He saw you when you uh, became 16. And by the way, he wants to talk to some of y'all. Uh, <laughs> he saw you graduate high school. He saw you through con- Listen, he has seen everything. He also, all the way up, teach me to number my days. Does he know how long I'm going to live? Absolutely he does. He knows the moment I'm going to die. He knows how I will die. He knows all of my life from one side to the other. And let me tell you something. He still chose you. Now you say, well, now what does all that mean? I don't know. I don't have a clue what all of that means. So I just simply know this. God has been there, has always been there, and has always known me and you. That is the moment when God experienced you. We can't say when that moment was because God has always been and God will forever always be. The thing is, you've not always been, but if you've trusted Jesus Christ, you will always be with him. Now, doggone, I'm going to tell you right now, if y'all were just Pentecostal, y'all would be falling in the floor. That's a good word. That's a comfort to us. And he's writing a church that is very discomforted in the culture that they're living in. Now, did God foreknow you? Sure he did. Did God's foreknowledge force you to make a decision for him? No. No. Did God choose you? Yes. Well, in his choosing of you, did that negate you from having to choose him? No. You say, I don't know that I understand that. Well, let me explain it in a very human term. I've got 11 grand boys, 11 of them, and uh, five granddaughters, but I got 11 grandsons. And if I brought them into Honey's house, because that's what it is, it's Honey's house, if I brought them to Honey's house and put them at Honey's table and I put a plate of spinach in front of them and I put a T-bone steak in front of them and I said, now boys, you band of brothers, uh, what, what you choose what you're going to eat. I can tell you right now what they're going to eat. They're going for the steak. They're not going for those greens. Every single one of them would say, now that's my foreknowledge of what those 11 grandsons will do. I know that, that I make them make that decision. Am I proud of them making that? Yes. Yes. Because I try to teach them don't eat anything green. Leave that stuff alone. Anyway, that's exactly what we're told here. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. But now I've got a Bible who tells me that right here. It states to me, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, I've also am told in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but would have everlasting life. Now I've got to hold both of those right here. I can't always get those two things to reconcile out. And you say, when I preach it, this is where it gets confusing. It's not that it's confusing. It's that it's part of the mystery of God's salvation. When Jesus says, whosoever, who is he referring to? Because there are some of those who say, well, Jesus is really referring to the elect. Well, why didn't Jesus use that? Ekletos. Why didn't he use that word? Why did he use the little particle there? All whosoever, we translate it, all, the all who put their faith in him, who trust in him, who come to him, who believe in him, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Jesus could have chose the Aramaic, the Hebrew, the Greek, or the Latin to use there, but he uses the little 
Aramaic word translated into the Greek, all, whosoever will, let him come. When Jesus says, whosoever will, let him come to me. Whoever's thirsty, let him come to me. You know what that is? That's an invitation. Whoever out there wants this, come to me. Now, not everyone's going to come. And he knows that. And yet he still calls. He still makes the plea for men to come to him. Men and women, you understand, uh, that's generic. So that's part of the mystery of God. I can't reconcile those two things together. Did God know it? Yes. Did God's knowledge of it force me into a decision? No. He's given us a free will. Others say, well, now wait a minute now. For man to have a free will, that limits the sovereignty of God. You've got to be kidding me. Let, let, let me just tell you something. For me to place my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ is not a work. It is obedience. It's obedience. It's not work. And my free will doesn't threaten a sovereign God one whit. Well, go back to what I was saying earlier about this. This is praise. He comes to this and he is praising God because of it. And that's exactly what it should do to let you in on the fact of the way I feel. The reason there is division among Baptists about this is from the devil. Our salvation is to result in the praise of God. That's what he's calling us to do. Whether you understand it all, whether you disagree with me and believe something else, that's fine. If you're saved, you ought to praise God for it. Amen. You ought to thank the Lord for our salvation because he comes here and he tells us this. He has chosen us for what? Look at the rest of the verse. That always helps. He also chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would what? Be holy and blameless before him. We can't do that on our own. That's part of his choosing. Part of his choosing is that we would become holy and blameless. And you say, when well, a preacher, I just can't do it. Well, neither can I. And the fact of the matter is we all know we can't do it. That's why God comes and puts his Holy Spirit in us to help us to work out this salvation that he's given to us. And do you know what? Listen to Jude. If you go to the last two verses of the little letter of Jude, you read this, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, how? Blameless with great joy. That is, he comes in this life and he gives you salvation and he is working on you to become holy and blameless and he will present you to himself one day blameless with great joy. So some of y'all ought to smile out there and at least act like you're happy that God chose you. And all that that means and all that is there for us, he chose us. He knew us long before the foundation of this world. And he's going to keep you safe until he gets you home. Now, let me give you the second thing, and the second thing is this. God planned not only our salvation, God planned our, ad our adoption in eternity past. Now, let's turn to the second sticky wicket here. In verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. Who's the beloved? Jesus Christ. Proorizo is the word um, predestined. Proorizo. Uh, according to Reinecker and Rogers, the word means literally to mark out a boundary ahead of time, to mark something out, uh, to foreordain something, uh, to set something in its own specific 
place, I suppose you could say. That's what the word predestined means. Now, let me, let me just give you this. The word predestined occurs five times in the ESV. For those of you using the ESV, it occurs five times in the NASB as well. Five times. Uh, we're going to look at that. Do you know how many times the word faith is used in the ESV? 475 times. So you're not coming to something that is major here, nor would we say it's minor. It is important, but uh, you just need to understand what that word means in every one of these places. Now that's part of what's on this sheet that I had run off for you that you can find that is out there, but I'm going to walk through these. The first place that you see this is all the way back. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching, and as he's preaching, I want you to listen to something, because there's another concept here that uh, people debate, well, what was elected? Was it you, or was it the means of salvation? Yes. You just read here in Ephesians where we're told that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. But now look at this. How was he going to, how was he going to save you in time? This man, verse 23, Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching that day of Pentecost. This man, speaking of Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. That is, God somewhere in eternity past had already planned to send Jesus Christ. You can go to Roman, you can go to Revelation chapter 13. I won't take the time to go there. Revelation chapter 13 and read where that lamb was slain from the foundation of the earth. So he has chosen also his plan of salvation. Part of that plan of salvation was to adopt you as his child. Again, that ought to be an amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed him to the cross. Now, who's, who's he saying did this? They did. God predetermined it, but did they do something? You better, be, you better believe they did. You nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You're never going to get away from this in Scripture that everything that deals with salvation is an absolute act of God, and you've got a responsibility. You have to make a decision. You'll go through life thinking, well, I'm elected, I don't need to do anything, and show up on that day, and God's going to say, I don't have a clue who you are. You have a decision to make. And that's not an act of work. As I stated, that is, a, that is an act of obedience. Well, there you have the first time it is used. God had determined that this was the means of salvation. The second time you're going to see that word is in this great passage in Romans chapter 8. Uh, you probably know it by heart. Romans chapter 8, where Paul comes and he's going to say, um, beginning in... Um, Verse 26, we're just going down to verse 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew. Now, by the way, foreknowledge and predestination are two different things. If not, you, you, you see this right here, he would not have used two different words in the Greek. And he would not have connected them by a conjunction. Um, he, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, do you see what he predestined here? Go back and look at the, at the verse, verse 30. Who, or back up to verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. That's what you're predestined to. God did not predestine these people to be saved and these people to go to hell. And you say, but hey, well, wait a minute, what do you do with Romans 9, 22? If you go back and look at that, that's a question. That's a conditional sentence, by the way. If this, then that. He's not stating that that's what God did. 
Number three, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 that we just read, he predestined us to what? Go to heaven? No, it's not what it says, but it says this. He predestined us to adoption as sons, as daughters, as the children of God. You come down now and you come to the uh, fifth time that you read about this in verse 11. We also, we have obtained an inheritance. Look at that. That's good stuff. You know what an inheritance is? It's what your son-in-law is going to get when you did. <laughs> and he's going out to get him an F-150 tricked out. I mean with everything on it. <laughs> so it, you, you should enjoy it while you got it. So he says, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. So he comes and he tells us, we have an inheritance. We're predestined to get it. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> We're predestined to that. That's God's will for our lives. Now, everybody wants to know, well, what's God's will for my life? What's God's will for my life? Well, he just comes and he's giving it to you right here. His will for you is this is that he has chosen you to be holy and blameless and he has predestined you to be his adopted child and he has predestined you to become like Jesus Christ, Romans chapter, and he's predestined you to an inheritance. He's not predestined you to go to hell. You wouldn't have a chance. If God did that, he'd still be right. He'd still be sovereign. He'd still be right. He'd still be holy. He would still be just. If that's what God had intended, he would be right in doing that. But that's not what God's word tells us he did. And so you can forget uh, using the argument, I don't need to make a decision because I am elect, or I don't need to make a decision because I'm not the elect and won't do me any good anyway. You've got a decision to make if you're here this morning, and you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ. In fact, let me, do, let me do this. All of that should create within every believer, not angst, but a joy. Amen. That one day, listen, what Jesus, what God had determined in the past, Jesus actually did on a cross and at an empty tomb, and he forgave me. And now all of heaven is mine. When I graduated Southwestern in 85 and went to my first church, man, I was scrambling for anything. I, I didn't start out as a, you know, a minister to youth or singles or anything. I just jumped full force into the pastorate, into preaching. And I was reading anything and everything I could get my hands on and uh, Gordon McDonald at the time, published author, uh, sought after speaker, pastor for a good period of time up in Massachusetts, uh, had just come out and announced that he had uh, committed adultery. And as I read that sitting in that little office of mine, I thought about my ministry for the years, all that's ahead of me. And, um, you know, you're, you're just scared to death. Y'all really don't know, but you're just scared to death. What am I going to do when I stand up in front of a congregation? How am I going to lead? What are all of these things that are landmines that I've got to miss? And here's one of your heroes, and he goes down in flames. And yet, I'm thankful to the Lord that he was restored. Uh, his marriage stayed solid, restored that marriage. And uh, God restored him to a ministry uh, for the remainder of his life. Well, Gordon tells a story about that. And he said one night he had a dream and he said he was in a big banquet room and he said it was just filled with people in this banquet room. And he said everybody had on a name tag. And he thought that was unusual, you know, because he could see the people's name there. But he said there was something else on the name tag that really shocked him. And he looked down at his name tag, and it had Gordon McDonald Adulterer. And he started looking at the other people, and it said, you know, 
Bob Dylan, liar. John Smith, cheater. You know, whatever, this and that and the other. And he said he just walked around looking at everybody's name tag and what was on the name tag when he heard all of this noise and he looked up and he said, Jesus just walked in the back door of that banquet room. And he said everybody was turning around and taking their name tag off and going and sticking it on Jesus. Gordon said he took his off and he walked up to Jesus and he stuck it on him. I want to tell you something. That's what excites me about salvation is that I know what I am. And in his love for me, did you notice that? It stated that he did this in love. Didn't even talk about that. But in love, he did this so that I could go to him and put my name on him and all of my sin. And from that moment on, I've become holy and blameless in the sight of the Father. Have you ever done that? Is that true of your life? Have you ever gone to Jesus and said, I'm just going to stick my name and my sin on you? And would you forgive me? Let's stand and pray about that.